All right. So your topic is financial management. So what I will do is I'll give you some kind of uh, to bring some structure to it. Uh, I'll show you uh, mainly. I want to spend some time uh, showing you some of the software that can be used to uh, discuss finance. So, uh, but we'll start with some structure to understand the role of the CFO. You know what a CFO is? Very good, excellent. So CFO is the Chief Financial Officer and uh, you heard this term called Treasurer. Yes. Treasurer, okay. So a Treasurer is also, in large companies there may be a CFO separately and a Treasurer that is separate from a CFO. But in some other, we, can, we are just going to use the word CFO because it's much shorter to encapsulate the role of both the, uh, the Treasurer and the CFO. Okay. Okay. I don't even know how to use this actually. Okay, there's a, there's a physical pointer. Okay, that's fine, no problem. All right, okay, so let's just try and concentrate on this framework to understand. So we're trying to give the, we're just going to use the word CFO, the CFO and treasurer, what are their roles, and we're going to discuss it in the context of the role of the firm. And then we'll go on to two, uh, to looking at how two of the most important jobs, which is capital raising and risk management, how they can be done. Okay. So if you look at this firm here, if you look at this framework here, you see the firm in the middle. Okay. And what we're going to show is, so this would be a little bit uh, in a lecture format. I won't be able to make it too interactive because you guys don't have mics, so I may not be able to hear. But if you have any question at a point of time, just feel free to ask, okay, because it's anyway not interactive. So let's at least make it interactive to that extent. If you have a question at any point of time, if you don't understand something, just ask. Okay, so you have the firm here and you can see here what we're trying to highlight in the middle of the uh, framework is that the firm is torn between two objectives okay on the one hand it has to grow its earnings obviously every business is set up to say make profits okay sometimes you have some of these non-profit corporations but mainly the world of business consists of companies that want to make a profit okay so they want to make a profit that means we've said that uh, that we represented by this idea of growing earnings okay and on the other side you also have to stay solvent because you don't want to become like kingfisher airlines you know what happened to them right then what happened to ILNFS are you following what is happening to ILNFS you guys need to be plugged in you need to be plugged in more to what's going on if you're students of business your BBA students right so how many people here uh, who heard, who's heard of what is happening to ILNFS nobody okay so this is not acceptable guys you have to be much more plugged in you need to be following global business news local business news local that is Indian business news both both global and local business news you need to be completely plugged in if something has happened last night in in the u.s which is of significance then you should be aware of it this morning so that is how you should be uh, preparing yourself as a student of business okay so island fs is a infrastructure leasing uh, company in india which has got into a lot of trouble because they failed to pay some installments on their debt okay so they are actually now in financial what we call financial distress the government has taken over the company and uh, Uday Kotak is managing the board and they're trying to figure out how to make things work. So this is, uh, so anyway, so this is just a message to you guys that you should be much more plugged in. Set up a Google News feed for business, it's quite easy. I'll show you some channels which you can use and, and track global news. So anyway, so the idea is that uh, coming back to the framework, the idea is that you have, uh, you also have, while you want to make, when you want to grow earnings, you also don't want to end up like Kingfisher Airlines. So you have to say, you heard this term solvency. Have you heard the expression solvency? Yes. We have a new law in India called the IBC, which came out in 2016. Do you know what that stands for? IBC 2016, new law, which is one of the fastest uh, pieces of legislation introduced anywhere in the world, anywhere in the Western style democracies around the world one of the fastest pieces of legislation introduced from conception to implementation and the signing by the president uh, what does IBC stand for again you should be aware of this it's called the insolvency and bankruptcy code okay it's meant to deal with all these bad loan problems that the banks have in India you're aware of the NPL problem are you guys aware of the NPL problem non-performing loans that our public sector banks have many many loans you've heard of the Nirav Modi scandal in PNB, 
Okay, so PNB has all these non-performing loans that are given to this guy effectively, credit extended. Okay, so solvency means the ability to pay your debts as they are coming due. That means you have enough cash and liquid assets on hand to pay your debts uh, as, your, as they are coming due. Okay. So that is what is meant by solvency. So the twin, what we're showing here, that the twin objectives of the firm are on the one hand, it has to grow earnings and on the other hand, it has to make sure that it stays solvent, okay? Now, why I'm saying these two are actually contradictory, these are, this requires a delicate balance is because how do you grow earnings? Do you think I have to take more risk or less risk in order to grow earnings? More risk, right? If you can't take risk, then if you don't take risk, then you won't be able to grow earnings. So on the one hand, if you want to grow earnings, you have to take more risk, okay? And on the other hand, uh, in order to stay solvent, do you think it's better to take more risk or less risk? Less. less risk, okay? So you have these twin objectives. On the one hand, you have to take more risk in order to grow your earnings. And on the other hand, you have to stay solvent. You have to make sure you stay solvent, okay? And that's why you have to take less risk. So you are kind of torn between these two objectives which are not consistent with each other. So this is a delicate balance in that balancing act that every business anywhere in the world has to manage. Okay, they have to manage this delicate balancing act, and this is where and one of the one of the divisions of the firm, uh, one of the uh, sort of functional areas of the firm that uh, deal, helps the company deal with these problems, uh, this kind of balancing act and do its uh, go through its operations is the financial finance function. Okay, which we are going to represent through the CFO. We're going to use the CFO to represent what the finance function does. Now you can see here what the company has to do in uh, growing earnings. If you grow earnings, you have two ways to grow earnings. You can see the two ways to grow, organic and inorganic. Anybody knows the difference between these two? Yes? You know, anybody knows the difference? Organic versus inorganic? Okay, I'll just tell you quickly, organic growth is when you are just growing as your own, uh, within you, as your own outfit. This is the software which is actually, I hope. Actually, I've loaded so much software that my laptop might be hanging. But hopefully this will work out. So this is just some software which we use and I hope that uh, Okay, it is coming so I will Okay guys, yeah If you have any problems understanding me, don't switch off, okay? Uh, if you have any problems understanding me, please ask the question again and then I'll explain it again, okay? Are you guys okay there that you're facing some problems? You're okay? Okay, so organic versus inorganic, this is something you can learn uh, from the session. Uh, organic means you're just growing, like let's say CCD, you know CCD, the cafe, cafe coffee day chain. Okay, so CCD sets up another, app, another outlet at the Patna airport, okay? That's an example of a new outlet at the Patna Airport. That's an example of organic growth because they're not buying some other company. They're setting up, they're just expanding their own operations. Okay. Now, if CCD buys Costa Coffee, that's an example of inorganic growth because Costa Coffee is a different company. Okay. So, if you buy, if CCD goes and buys, acquires, you heard of MA, mergers and acquisitions, you heard of that? Okay, so if they do one of these M&A transactions and they go buy a different coffee company called Costa Coffee and that's an example. So what happens? Suppose Costa Coffee has 27 uh, branches, okay, or 27 outlets and CCD has, let's say, 27 outlets. So now once CCD buys Costa Coffee, now together CCD will have now 54 outlets. So suddenly their number of outlets has doubled. But this growth, so this is also an example of growth. Okay, we assume that there's some amount of sale in every outlet. Okay, but this is also an example of growth. But this we don't call organic growth. We call it inorganic growth. Okay, what is the subject in which you heard the distinction in school? Physics, mathematics, 
where organic versus inorganic chemistry. chemistry right so the same this idea comes from there that organic growth is when you are expanding your own operations without buying any new new company inorganic growth is when you expand your operations just by virtue of buying a new company which already has some existing operations so suddenly your in this case your number of outlets is doubled okay that's inorganic growth so this growth but inorganic growth so obviously when you have inorganic growth uh, you are going to have to raise money okay so we're going to try and see this is what the company has to do and these are some of the functions that the finance team will have to do okay so obviously when you want to buy so if ccd wants to buy costa coffee maybe that uh, particular acquisition will cost maybe let's say 100 million dollars so they have to somehow raise 100 million dollars if they don't have the cash in the bank they have to find some way to raise the 100 million dollars to finance that acquisition is this clear so one of the jobs that the finance manager has is one of the most important jobs of a finance manager of a cfo <coughs> is capital raising okay so here what you're seeing is now you're starting to connect what we're trying to do through this framework is to show you the fundamental conflict that the firm is facing and the, the activities that the firm is going to engage in and then how the finance function has to uh, perform its own duties within the larger framework of the firm to help the firm achieve its objective is this clear are you following this framework okay so this is the idea here so you can see that as they try to do organic uh, inorganic growth the capital raising becomes an important job for the finance function but even for organic growth even for organic growth if let's say say as we stick with the same example ccd is trying to set up a new outlet in the patna airport then obviously that's not a that's going to require some money so you have to give them some money if you have to lay out some cash up front so that they can pay the lease for the stall they can buy some of the materials that they're going to need all this requires money so the cfo's job is also to fund what we call funding the business units okay so maybe this will be part of a particular zone in patna some business unit within a particular zone in patna where the airport is located so that zone that business that zone is a business unit for ccd ccd and that business unit will have to be funded by the cfo to make sure that they can go through this operation of putting in that outlet in the airport is this clear so we say that the other function that the uh, the cfo has to perform is to fund the business unit as uh, all the business units as they go through their day to day operations and try to grow the business are you following so far okay so two important functions for the cfo that we have uh, uh, isolated now as a result of this uh, from from this framework capital raising and funding business units okay right now on the question of solvency on the question of solvency you can see that there is uh, there are a couple of things that the company uh, that the cfo has to do those yellow things are the functions uh, that the finance function has to uh, undertake two important ones cash management and risk management cash management is just how you manage all your funds okay your you all the cash that has been the cash the cash that is going to be generated by the business the cash that you have from short term investments how you manage the cash where you put it into which account that's called cash management okay making sure your <coughs> your receivables are collected clearly uh, early and put quickly into the bank in liquid uh, cash that is all cash management the other important thing the very important role that the corporate treasury has to perform the cfo is risk management okay risk management is you heard this expression before yes sir okay risk management so risk management is completely focused on this objective of staying solvent if you don't manage your risk you will no longer be solvent okay many airlines now in europe for instance are facing the threat of bankruptcy because they have uh, because the jet fuel prices oil prices are quite high okay so these people have if they've not managed their risk properly they could face the risk of bankruptcy so risk management is completely focused on saying staying solvent so two of the most important roles uh, from this that we want to focus on in this presentation for the cfo are capital raising and risk management okay so this is clear so far from this framework what the role of the cfo what the cfo does now i put tax so typically this is also a useful guide for you guys when you are going in if you are going in for careers in business down the line you want to do an mba if you are interested in a finance role typically if you are going into a non bank into a this is the non financial uh, uh, sector this uh, business firm that i'm showing is a non financial firm okay 
The same framework applies also to financial firms, but this is mainly focused on non-financial. But these guys, if you're going in for a corporate treasury kind of job, these are the kinds of jobs you will be doing. Either doing uh, funding business units, capital raising, risk management. These are the kind of jobs or profiles that your MBA will have. The one in blue, tax, legal, regulatory, that is not normally given to MBAs because you need to have an LLB or a CA or a CPA, some kind of accounting qualification. You need for tax, legal and regulatory, typically you need professional qualifications like accounting degrees or law degrees. Only then you go in there. But with MBA degrees, you go into the areas that are in yellow. Okay, this is also for your understanding of roles. Okay, so now let's look at how risk management is done in corporations. Okay, so typically let's look at So I should just give you what happens in the case of risk management is that uh, companies face risks from uh, several types of activities. Okay, one is they might take a they might have taken a loan. Okay, if they if a company has taken a loan, let's say a company is earning money in U.S. dollars. Okay, and a comp but the company has taken a loan in uh, yen. If a company which has revenues only in U.S. dollars and has taken a loan in yen. Okay. Is this is this is there a problem for the company? Is there any risk? What is the risk? You guys are aware of exchange rates, foreign exchange markets. Like you can see prices here. Can you see these prices here? Uh, dollar yen. These all these are foreign exchange prices. Okay. If you see these are actually moving around. These prices are moving. Uh, today is a market day. Today is a market day. So today is uh, Friday, right? Okay, so you if you notice the prices are actually changing. Can you see that? Okay, so if you see for instance if we make a very short term chart like a This data is actually live data Okay, so You will notice that this chart will keep on changing now. This is a sh very short term chart on the dollar yen Okay, this is a dollar yen exchange rate which means this is actually showing this 11220 dollar yen uh, yen is the currency of which country japan. japan right very good so um, now as you can see you'll notice that the chart will keep on moving because this chart is live so these are actually these are actual foreign exchange rates that you are seeing as the foreign exchange market is open actually the market trades actively between monday to friday 24 24 hours literally okay so uh, you will see that uh, this will keep on moving now this, what is this? This 112.20. What does this mean? Is it like 112.20, uh, 112.2 yen per dollar, or is it 112.2 dollars per yen? Very good, excellent. So this is how conventionally the uh, foreign exchange market quotes prices. If you see, it says uh, earlier in the first part, it says USD. And in the second part it says JPY okay so the way the convention is is that the first one that is quoted the US dollar so that means that's what we call the base currency so that means it's going to be one US dollar and then the the second one that is quoted you see the price okay so this is the price of one US dollar as you can see here the dollar is getting stronger in this chart also because uh, at the beginning of the chart here you can see at that one point that is just quite this is quite recent this is 26th october this is new york time actually 11:23. in new york the dollar was trading around 112.12 yen which means it was costing you 112.12 yen to buy one us dollar at that time in the 26th october that is yesterday basically in new york it was costing that this now suddenly the dollar has become a little stronger because now it's costing you around 112.20 so from 112.12, it is now costing 112.2. So it is higher now, the rate is higher, which means here because it's number of yen per, for $1. So now it's costing more yen to buy $1. So we say which currency has gotten stronger, dollar or yen? Dollar has gotten stronger because it's costing more yen to buy $1, okay? So this is basically the idea. Now what happens is, if you have as you can see here now again this on the short term chart the dollar is dropping okay but if you see there are certain parts uh, where okay. 
so if you focus on this part let's say if you focus on this part of the here I'm just changing the granularity of the chart okay so if you just focus on this part of the movement okay from here to here where I'm moving the cursor okay from about this part to this part what was happening was the dollar getting stronger or weaker here the dollar was getting weaker right so if you just focus on this part and see this part so the movement is not always in the same direction okay it is not always clear cut in the same direction it is in in uh, many uh, you know there, there are many twists and turns okay as you can see there are many twists and yeah because prices are being input just like when you go to a mandi you can see that vegetables are being traded so potato prices also do not remain the same onion prices do not remain the same there are shifts in supply and demand there's some kind of supply disruption then onion prices might go up so it is essentially the same thing that it is interaction of essentially you can see here this is an international market these uh, spot foreign exchange markets are the biggest markets in the world they trade 5.1 trillion dollars a day of volume okay uh, and, you know every day so this is uh, like data from a couple of years back uh, earlier it was even higher it was 5.3 per trillion per day so these there's a uh, very uh, you know there's a vast number of players you know pension funds hedge funds mutual funds corporations okay who are trying to hedge their foreign exchange exposure everybody is playing in this market and they're combined uh, they're basically creating some people want to sell dollars some people want to buy dollars okay depending on their circumstances and their views and this interplay of supply and demand causes the price to shift okay so as there are market makers who are quoting prices in the market but as their position changes and as they see that maybe today they are seeing that a lot of people coming to buy dollars on balance because it's never going to be the same it's never going to be equally balanced there's always some kind of mismatch so maybe today they are seeing what they are seeing is that there, are, there is a little excess demand for dollars more and more people are coming to buy dollars there's higher volume of transactions on the buy side okay I mean people want to buy more and more and more dollars so this is pushing the price up okay so as you know you got you guys have done your economics yes when there is excess supply that means supply exceeds demand what happens to the price price goes down right when there's excess supply price will go down when there's excess demand price will go up okay so what you're witnessing here from this kind of chart um, in the dollar yen market what you can clearly see is that there is excess demand today at least in this time frame in this time frame there is excess demand okay so uh, we were discussing yeah so why is the leverage rate offered by trading companies higher in currency forex market compared to yeah that is partly a function of regulation okay so his question is guys please be quiet let when he's asking his question is very relevant so it's, it's a it's an opportunity to every question is an opportunity to learn something new okay so let's use that opportunity now uh, the his question is why is the leverage rate uh, higher in uh, for in uh, foreign exchange markets than in the uh, equity markets okay the answer first let's be clear about what leverage means okay I don't think everybody is 100% clear about what leverage do you understand what leverage means I don't think everyone we, we need to clarify this concept as well is everyone clear about what leverage means not really yes or no you know what what is leverage how would you define leverage yes yeah yeah so leverage is let's just say if you look at leverage essentially is nothing there's a very similar there's a simple way to remember there's a mathematical expression for leverage leverage is nothing but the total I don't know if there is a pen here there is a pen here I'll just use the pen um, or I'll try to do it on a spreadsheet so that I'll be better a little bit um, so leverage is total leverage is basically total to position value um, divided by I'll have to make this
okay total position value divided by okay account equity is just the amount of uh, equity that you have you guys are all familiar with the balance sheet concept equity and debt okay everyone knows equity and debt so equity is just the money that you put up and debt is what you borrow okay so the account equity when you have trading accounts so he's asking this question in the context of trading accounts he's talking about why is uh, the leverage higher in foreign exchange trading accounts as compared to uh, equity trading accounts okay so i'm coming to that question answer but before that i think we should clarify the concept of leverage so that you have a systematic and a mathematical understanding of leverage leverage is mathematically nothing but total position value divided by account equity and account equity is just the amount of money that you have put up from your side in the account is this clear so far to everyone okay so now what is total position value this mathematical expression you understand obviously but we have to also clarify what is total position value total position value is nothing but has to be also okay so let mm, this is leverage so it's a little messy but at least you are able to see better uh, is better than being exposed to my handwriting right it's better at least you read this okay so leverage this also has to be um, formatted all right so leverage equals total position so, so now you have a systematic understanding of this you don't have to ever forget it okay so leverage equals total position value by account equity okay and then what is total position value that is also simple price per unit into total number of units okay so if oil is trading at 80 dollars a barrel okay and you have bought a thousand barrels of oil then your position value is how much eighty thousand dollars okay oil is trading at eighty dollars per barrel okay and you are tra you have bought a thousand dollar thousand barrels of oil so your position value now is eighty thousand uh, dollars because price per unit into number of units okay in this in the case of oil oil is traded in barrels it's not traded in grams or quintals it is traded in barrels okay so now coming back to his question okay so now we understand what leverage is okay so his question essentially what he's saying is that in equity markets the leverage is quite low which means that compared to total position value you have to put up a huge amount of equity okay whereas in foreign exchange markets leverage is quite high because let's say if, if they let you uh, put up five dollars if they let you put up five dollars of uh, equity and control a hundred dollar position in this case your leverage would be we say your leverage is 20s to one is this clear when your position value is 100 and your account equity is five so we say that your leverage is 20 times or normally we say it as 20s to one is everyone following so his question now the answer to his question i mean long answer to his question but i want to make sure that people understand the related concepts so uh, the reason that this happens is that equity markets are generally exchange traded markets have you heard the distinction between exchange traded markets and otc markets you don't know this okay so uh, maybe i'll share a video that i have one of the classes that we have where we discuss this concept so um, this anyway so exchange traded markets are stuff like nse bse all these kind of exchanges right the cme group you guys have heard of nse bse yes. okay so you need to be plugged in and it seems like some people haven't heard of them so exchange traded markets tend to be there they're on a particular exchange and they're much more tightly regulated by the government okay and the government mandates so the reason for your low account low leverage and equities is this because the government says that it should be so there's no reason for it necessarily to be that way but it's the, it is the way it is that way because in most countries the governments regulate these markets tightly uh, and some more uh, so than others but uh, it is government regulation that mandates that equity trading leverage should be quite low 
Okay, and in the case of foreign exchange markets, there are actually an example of what you see here, for instance, or you can also see here. You see here what is the same stuff that you're seeing. You saw that dollar yen was around 112. This is a different software actually. Here you can see that it's moved up a little. It's the same thing that 112, 22, level, same. Two different pieces of software, but the price is the same because they're talking about the same market. Okay. So here, like these things, like ESLA is a symbol for which which company? TSLA is the equity uh, trading symbol for which company? Anybody heard of electric cars? Yes. Tesla, right? So TSLA is the Tesla has been a lot in the news lately because they came out with their earnings just a couple of days ago. So that would be an exchange traded market. TSLA, common stock of Tesla, equity shares of Tesla, they trade on exchanges. They are exchange traded markets. This stock, this euro dollar, US sterling, USD, dollar yen. These are OTC markets. These are foreign exchange markets, which are OTC markets. And you can see the prices trading here. These markets tend to be, OTC markets tend to be much less regulated. The global foreign exchange market is much less uh, tightly regulated. And that is one of the reasons why it's the most liquid market in the world. Okay, it is so liquid it, and, and trades such high volume, but it's a largely unregulated market. So because the market is unregulated, you have, I mean, the players can decide, okay, like this particular software that we are using, which we use for some of our projects. Now, on this account here, you can actually change account leverage also. I don't know if the option is on this menu. Yeah, you see this? There's an option of changing leverage. Okay, so on this software, this is actually a foreign exchange trading software. It is pr provided by this company called Oanda, uh, which is a market maker in foreign exchange. And this is actually the game software which we use for our project. So here, everything is real except for the money in the account. That is the paper money, obviously, because it's a game software. But everything else is real. The prices are real. The news is real. So uh, here you can change your leverage because every player in the market can decide what leverage they want to give their customers. Because the regulation is quite light or lacks regulation, not much regulation. So the market players have their freedom to decide what they want to do. Okay, so long answer to your question, but you have some idea now? Yes. Okay, all right. So we'll try to do that. We want to make sure it's very important because I think the main reason you want to come to class is mainly to be able to ask questions. So I'll make sure that we address all the questions rather than my giving you a lecture. Because uh, everything, that's actually, if you think about it, that's the real way, only reason because, uh, to come to class, to have the freedom to ask questions. Because everything else can be uh, recorded and given to you. Okay, so we were talking about risk management. Okay, and we were talking about why a company might have risk. Okay, and that's we, when we came to this chart. Okay. So we said that if you look at this phase here, from, from this part to this part, okay. In this phase, what is happening is the dollar is, as, as some of you pointed out, the dollar is getting weaker or stronger? Weaker. weaker. Okay. Now think, go back to the example that, a comp that we gave you, that a company which has revenues in US dollars, it has revenues only in US dollars, but it has taken a yen and a loan in yen. Okay. It's taken a loan in yen. So if it has to repay, now typically what will happen when you take a loan in yen, the loan liability is fixed in yen terms because you took a yen loan. So you take a $2 billion, billion as in B, a B for Bombay, $2 billion loan in yen, 2 billion yen. So later on when the yen mature, when the loan matures, you have to pay back the bank 2 billion yen, right? Then the bank doesn't really care what the dollar yen exchange rate was when you took the loan and what it is when you're paying back the loan after five years, okay? The bank doesn't really care. And all it wants to do is, uh, let's go back to the weekly chart. I think we have more, um, more of a period of weak interest rates and I can also try and open so the bank doesn't care that uh, uh, whether the yen has strengthened or weakened since you took the loan you still have to pay back the bank two billion dollars a uh, two billion yen okay now what would happen if that in that period as you saw there uh, where, as the in this period again this is suppose you you do it in this period okay suppose you took the loan suppose you took the dollar loan uh, you, you took the yen loan 
I'm trying to get my cursor. Suppose you took the yen loan here. Okay, in July 2007, when the dollar yen was trading around 123. It was trading around 123 when you took the yen loan, okay? And you have revenues only in dollars. And now when you have to repay the loan, it is now September 11, September 2011, okay? So around four years later. Now, what has happened in this four year period since you took the loan? The dollar has weakened, okay? And your revenues are in dollars, okay? Now you need to buy back 2 billion yen. So now at the end of the at the maturity of the loan do you need to pay more dollars for each for each yen are you able to see the situation because what has happened earlier and you have to flip it around actually in 2007 in 2007 the dollar one yen was trading at 123.2 right approximately so you needed 123.2 yen to buy one dollar okay Another way of saying that is to say that with one dollar you could have bought 123 yen. Okay, is that is that okay? We can flip it around and say one dollar was going to buy you 123 yen in 2007 when you took the loan. But now when it comes to time to repay the loan, what is happening is one dollar is able to buy only about 75 yen. Okay, so one dollar is able to buy only 75 yen. So compared to uh, when you look at the yen amount of 2 billion yen which you took the loan for okay in 2007 uh, you you would have had to spend much more that would have been equal to much fewer dollars because with much fewer dollars you could have equal uh, paid up 2 billion yen so assuming that you bought borrowed the 2 billion yen how the way it works is the money is given to you in yen the loan bank gives you the loan in yen and then what you do is in the spot foreign exchange markets you go and sell the yen and you buy dollars because you need only dollars your operations are in dollars your revenues are in dollars so what will you do with yen you just took a loan in yen because the interest rates are low you thought you know you were very smart you took a loan in yen because you saw low interest rates compared to dollars so you took a loan in yen so, but actually when you take the loan you sell the yen in the spot market and you buy dollars Okay, so you got a certain amount of dollars at that point. You got a, you know, quite a bit of dollars. But when you have to repay the loan, you find that one dollar is able to buy only 75 yen. So compared to 2007, now you have to shell out a lot more dollars to pay back those two billion yen. Is, are you able to, are you able to follow that? Okay, so this is what is called foreign exchange risk. This is one of the types of risk. Okay, so this is basically what is known, and this is very common. The, you know it's a common type of risk that many companies face okay this is an example of foreign exchange risk and this will also give you a flavor of what is meant by risk management so this risk has to be managed because if if you did not manage this risk properly and the loan amounts can be very big okay so suddenly you may find that you have a massive dollar shortfall because you don't have enough dollars to pay back 2 billion yen okay and so your revenues are not sufficient to pay back and then you can get into all kinds of problems there have been cases in India also when many Indian companies who had taken loans in foreign currencies when the loans came due they did not have enough they could not generate enough rupees to pay back those loans okay it's the same kind of problem so this is an example of foreign exchange risk management okay and the way you have to manage this risk is that you have to look at the this is a chart of the dollar yen okay and I've tried to actually give you a this is actually a chart of the oil price so I could actually now flip around to make the discussion more interesting you've already seen one example of uh, yeah. you've seen one example of risk we've seen an example of foreign exchange risk okay now we to make it more interesting we'll move to an example of commodity price risk okay so okay let's just briefly spend a little bit of time on the dollar yen uh, so how would you manage this risk so what the company has to do what now this is where the CFO comes in and the role of the finance team so the CFO has to be continuously monitoring the foreign exchange markets okay so you can see here on this chart you can see this is a pre period from about 2003 onwards to 2000 to the current day these prices are current okay that's why you see the same 1 to 20 kind of price these are live charts so these are current these are plotted on a weekly basis here so you can see all this movement can you see how dramatically it has moved okay it has moved quite dramatically so if you are not careful and you don't manage your risk carefully you could be caught on the wrong side of this and it could cost you a lot of money and you have, remember you are representing the company as the CFO so your company might actually go bankrupt 
many companies have gone bankrupt because they could not manage their risk properly okay so you can see so essentially what the CFO has to do is monitor the foreign exchange markets and and the other very important thing that a CF, uh, that every finance uh, you know finance decision maker uh, working in a, a decision maker working in a finance role has to do is you have to take a view on the market okay you understand what is meant by taking a view on the market that is you have to take a call you have to take you have to make an assumption that I, I mean you got to make an assumption either that the dollar is going to drop or that the dollar is going to rise okay that's what is meant by taking a view on the market if I look at Indian stocks and I say I think that the nifty will rise now quite dramatically and then I go in and buy a whole bunch of stocks because my view is that the market is going to rise dramatically that's what that's called taking a view on the market but in fact you'll notice that it's not just in those situations but even a CFO while managing risk for its company for his company will have to take a view on the market okay there's no role in finance that is available to MBA students where you do not have to take a view on the market everything that you see in finance you'll see you'll notice when you study them in depth that they are all affected by financial markets that's why when I teach finance when I teach guys there's too much talking guys those who are not interested guys at the back you are with your bag why don't you leave we will give you attendance don't talk because there are some people who are actually willing to listen so don't make create a disturbance for them okay you have an attendance angle here that you will come here you'll get attendance is that right okay so many people have come for attendance so why don't you we will we'll give you attendance you just sign a sheet and why don't you carry on if you're not interested then you sit around and disturb people uh, it's better if you uh, you know go away okay uh, so uh, what was I saying I just got lost now okay what was I saying I was talking about risk management. okay taking views on the market okay so one of the things okay when I teach finance I teach the finance electives so the entire teaching of the elective courses in finance is heavily focused on financial markets and there's a reason for that the reason is because we are trying to develop the skills that the students must have in order to be effective in their roles in in the finance function okay and in order to be effective you need to have uh, uh, you know not only theoretical knowledge but you need to be able to, you need to be very comfortable with taking views on the market okay taking views means just taking a position that I think this uh, oil I think that oil prices are going down or I think that oil prices are going up okay this is a very definite view do you understand that that means you're taking a very definite position if you say oil prices are going down and if you sell oil now then if prices go up then you're going to be in trouble because you've already sold so this is there's a risk involved there is uncertainty because no one really knows what's going to happen but even in the face of uncertainty in order to do your role properly in order to perform your role properly you have to take a view on the market and you have to take a decision based on your view are you following okay is this this is what is required so therefore the teaching of finance is very focused on financial markets that's why you guys need to be completely steeped in financial markets you need to know what's going on and develop a feel for the markets okay so essentially what the CFO will have to do in the case of foreign exchange risk he will have to monitor the foreign exchange markets continuously okay and he will have to take a view on the market and if he feels that the dollar is going to drop sharply against the yen he will have to go and hedge that risk that he has what happened we are running out of time okay okay so uh, he will the CFO will have to take a view on the market if he feels that the dollar is going to happen is something like this is going to happen if he feels that we are at this kind of situation where the dollar might drop against the yen if he feels we are somewhere here then he will actively go out and take uh, uh, take out a hedge position against the exposure okay this is where you need to understand what a hedge position is okay you know what a hedge position is a hedge okay so uh, in order to understand what a hedge position is you have to first underline understand what is an underlying position okay so the hedge position actually is kind of opposite to the underlying position I'll try to just pick up the notes and uh, So the underlying position essentially is uh, just 
the position that you have as a result of your business activities okay and one of the business activities that you have done here is that you have taken out financing in yen because you thought that yen interest rates were so low compared to us dollars so you got great i've got cheap financing let me take out a loan of you know five billion yen so you've done that and then um okay so the underlying position essentially is uh, there's a lot of detail here but i'll just give you an idea it's nothing but what the exposure that you have okay the position that you have because of what if your natural business activities okay your natural business activity in this case has been to borrow yen in this case you have borrowed yen because you thought yen interest rates were low so in this case you have a position in the dollar yen market which is you're actually uh, sh you're actually short uh, if you're long dollar yen okay you're long dollar yen you understand the difference between long and short do you guys understand long and short long dollar yen means you have you have bought dollars and sold yen look at this transaction is everyone getting confused here are you following is this discussion making sense to you so far is it making sense okay so we'll continue so what i'm going to do is instead of focusing on covering a lot of material i'll just try to make sure that we cover some material we covered in depth and address all the questions around it okay okay so you notice something here all of these things uh, especially the currency markets i'll come to the others later but you see here it's all uh, there are two currencies can you see that dollar and yen there are two currencies okay then here there is aussie versus you aud is which currency aud is which currency australian dollar okay all right so uh, australian dollar then eur is which currency euro okay so you can see they're all given in pairs okay they're all given in pairs okay so essentially which we see think about any transaction that you do it's, it'll clear things up very easy uh, very quickly when you go to the market and buy sugar okay are you trading in is there only one asset involved is it just sugar that there is a tran the transaction there's a transaction right you go to the market and you buy one kilo of sugar okay so in this transaction there are two assets involved there is sugar and what is the other asset sorry INR. somebody said INR or rupees right because what is the trade happening you are giving him some rupees let's say 50 rupees and you are getting some one asset on the other side that is sugar you are getting a kilo of sugar and you are giving him 50 rupees so actually the two assets that are being exchanged here is one is sugar and one is indian rupees okay so typically what will happen is the same kind of transaction is being done in tokyo okay local market in tokyo then you would be exchanging sugar against what japanese yen okay because they will not be trading in rupees they will trade in Jap in indian uh, japanese yen local currency so the idea is here the basic the fundamental idea here is that you have to think of every transaction as involving two assets in any market every transaction whether they mention it explicitly or not okay here in the currency markets you can see they have explicitly mentioned aud usd euro G uh, gbp okay or usd jpy okay euro jpy here they have mentioned it specifically but whether they have mentioned it specifically or not every transaction involves two assets you are always buying one and selling the other is this clear in every market so in the sh what we say is the terminology that we use is that in any market whatever is the unit that is being traded okay whatever like in this case you can see uh, here the the the, uh, the asset that is being priced is actually dollars in the dollar yen case in this dollar yen case you see the price is moving around continuously the price what is what is actually changing is this is what this is one dollar equals to some amount of yen okay variable amount of yen and that variable amount is continuously changing okay but that one dollar business is not changing it's always one dollar on one side it is only the price that is changing in terms of yen okay so the expression that we use here is base we use the expression we can use this general expression uh, one is base asset and one is terms asset i can just write it here to make it uh, we can use this expression 
Um, okay, so now very basic market knowledge. Okay, so we can use the expression base asset and terms asset. So in the case of this, coming back to the dollar yen example, coming back to the dollar yen example, you see that the one dollar part is never changing. Okay, it is always the price of one dollar. But how much to pay for one dollar? That keeps changing. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> I have a tendency to shout. So my throat goes for a toss. So the point to understand here is, if we, as we come to the idea of underlying position, we have to get some basic knowledge of markets. The way that any market anywhere in the world functions is, a market is like a venue to exchange assets. That's a way of thinking about the market, of any market. And you always exchange two assets, one asset for another, okay? So you're exchanging sugar for Indian rupees. Here you're exchanging dollars for yen. You're exchanging dollars for yen. And always there's one side which is never changing here, the dollar, one dollar part is never changing. So the part that is never changing, we call that the base asset. So in the dollar yen market, we will say that the US dollar is the base asset. And because how is the US dollar here in this market, the US dollar is being priced. We say that the, U, we say that the US dollar is being priced. How is it being priced? In terms of yen. Okay, like we go, we go to buy a sari. How is the sari priced? In terms of rupees some are 2000 some are 6000 some maybe 15000 okay they're all saris but they are differently priced and they're all priced in terms of rupees okay so this is the idea so the the terms that we use base asset and terms asset okay base asset and the part that is never changing that is being priced that's called the base assets kind of because it's kind of like the base okay the foundation so that is more fixed okay and that we call the base asset and the and the currency or the uh, unit in which or the asset in which that particular base asset is being priced in terms of which it is being priced so it's easier to remember terms asset because the dollars are being priced in terms of yen sugar is being priced in terms of rupees so that's why we'll call the rupee the terms asset okay so if you have this basic general conception you can see any market anywhere in the world doesn't matter what you're looking at will always have two assets there will be an exchange of two assets and then you can call one of them the base asset and the other one the terms asset okay so the point to notice is in the currency market notation you can see the last currency market example usd nok nok is which currency any guess Scandinavia, Norwegian, Kron Norwegian Krona, okay, the currency is called Krona, so NOK is Norwegian Krona, okay, so uh, in the case of currency market quotations, you will see that both the assets are mentioned, okay, but what about copper, what about gold, what about oil, can you see those markets there also trading, can you see them as well, those prices, so they have not mentioned any other asset because copper is only one asset gold is also only one asset okay oil is also only one asset so what is the other asset in those markets any idea let's pull up one of those charts let's take oil okay now what is happening to oil what does this mean the oil chart this is the u.s crude oil price west texas intermediate is a grade of crude oil in the u.s markets in the north american market in America, it's a US market basically. So, uh, what does this mean? First, it was around 66.90. Now, it has come to 66.65. What is this business of 66.65? What is it? These are the prices of oil. Okay, I already told you something earlier in the course of some other discussion that oil is priced in what? Barrels. Okay, oil is priced in barrels. So, that means we know that. So here, what do you think the base asset is in this market? Anybody, any guess? What is the base asset? Oil, oil, okay. Oil is the base asset and the unit is, I already told you, is one barrel. So whatever you're seeing is the price of one barrel, okay, of oil, okay, and in particular West Texas oil. But what is the terms asset? What do you think it is? Anybody wants to guess? 
is oil a major internationally traded commodity is it a majorly major globally traded commodity like you make it in Saudi Arabia Norway and you ship it to buying countries like China Japan India it is going all over the globe okay it is being globally traded so what do you think what uh, what is the terms asset do you think the terms asset is likely to be everything is bought in terms of some currency I said in yen in Japan when you're buying sugar in Tokyo you're paying in yen so in the case of oil what currency do you think people are using okay so the answer is US dollars okay safe bet whenever you're looking at any internationally traded commodity okay the US dollar is the most dominant currency in the international markets okay uh, the US is by far the most dominant economy in the world okay no economy comes anywhere close okay all this hype you hear about China India Brazil taking over the U in United States it's all rubbish it's not going to happen and even in your lifetime forget about my lifetime no way it's going to happen okay so the US is the most dominant country and so everything is a safe as a normal uh, safe guess any globally traded commodity terms asset is going to be US dollars okay so all these three commodities that I've shown you copper gold and crude oil they are all globally traded commodities okay they are all traded in US dollars so so the other thing so one thing we learned is that in any market a market is like a venue for exchanging assets okay and any market we can define a base asset and a terms asset okay and in the currency markets both are being mentioned but in the case of other markets like crude oil copper some of the commodities markets we see sometimes and even the equity markets we see that the terms asset is not being explicitly mentioned but that does not mean that there is no terms asset there is always a terms asset you cannot have a market without a terms asset okay because there has to be an exchange otherwise you're just giving oil away for free you want something in return okay so therefore there is always a terms asset and you need to know you need to have contextual knowledge of the market concerned to understand what is the terms asset so when you go back to the example of crude oil the terms asset is US dollars so here what is happening is 6690 US dollars per barrel now it has come down to 6665 US dollars per barrel okay this is how the price of oil is fluctuating you can see how much it fluctuates okay and this is also a very important commodity for India because we are severely affected by oil prices okay you're aware of that and right now we have a big budgetary problem because of the oil price uh, rise in the oil price okay so again another example of uh, we are discussing the concept of risk management okay that's why we came to this market okay so here if you see now let's go back to one more um, Yeah, let's give you an idea about oil prices okay this is another chart of oil prices I'll just blow this up and to give you an idea of okay, I can't without my mouse hard to make this move around but you can see actually you can get some idea about the ball about the volatility of oil prices you can see that see it has gone from 2004 around 30 dollars okay to about 100 this went to 148 dollars okay you can see how sharply it rises and you see how sharply it falls okay these are all real prices i'm not i didn't draw these charts these are all real history how oil prices actually move okay so this is how it moves and this is where it is now this is where we have problems now because it has gone up so much okay all right so this is an example of oil prices how volatile they can be can you see how it is changing so rapidly Changing so rapidly means that it's always going to create risk because some people will be on one side, some people will be on the other side. Okay. So what is? Let's look at it from this point of view now. If you look at it from India's point of view, okay, what is good for us? Oil prices falling or rising? Falling. Falling is good for us. Okay. So in this case, we see, and you guys said you already understood what is meant by long and short. You understand what is meant by long and short, right? long means you have bought something short means you have sold something okay you have essentially now we know the terminology of base asset and terms asset long means you have bought the base asset okay and short means you have sold the base asset and remember it's an exchange so whatever you have done to the base asset you have done the opposite to the terms asset when you went to the market you bought sugar and you can think of it as you sold rupees 
you bought sugar and you sold rupees so it's always opposite whatever you do to the base asset opposite is being done to the terms asset so if you have sold oil that means you have bought what US dollars okay you sold oil you have bought US dollars okay so uh, this is the situation that we this is what we roughly mean by long and short there is actually a more uh, uh, advanced definition which we need not bring in at this stage uh, so here, here we have uh, your long and short is very clear short means sale of base asset long means purchase of base asset okay now what we see is if you look at um, I'm just going to because without my mouse I'm not able to manipulate this okay let's look at this now this period now uh, you can see here this period as we we'll just focus on this part okay this part from 2017 July about June of 2017 till today okay a lot of re a significant increase in the oil price from about 42 43 dollars to a high of about 77 okay this dramatic increase in the oil price is it good for India or is it bad for India? Bad for India because we are paying more and more rupees and on top of that you are seeing not seeing the other part, part of the picture which is the other part of the picture is this remember that when you are looking at a country like India so oil is traded internationally in terms of which currency? US dollars, US dollars okay but our currency is not US dollars so if we want to buy oil okay we have to look at one more thing what is happening here is this good news or bad news this is also bad news okay so if we because what we have is rupees what the government of India has is rupees what HPC, LBPCL, IOC, ONGC all these guys what they have is rupees okay they have to use these rupees to buy oil so it is like a two-step process first they have to use the rupees to buy dollars then they have to sell those dollars and use that to buy do buy oil is this clear so it's a two-step process for us okay now what is happening is you are getting hit on two fronts you are getting hit because the dollar is getting stronger against the rupee so for each rupee you can buy fewer and fewer dollars is this clear each rupee buys you fewer and fewer dollars is everyone clear about that because each dollar is buying more and more rupees okay it used to be earlier so much so much less okay 42 and 29 and all that in 2008 okay it was 40 dollars and now it is now 75 okay nearly 75 dollars so each dollar is buying so many more rupees that means the flip side is each rupee is buying less and less dollars okay so now when we go to buy oil when IOC goes to buy oil we are we are stuck we are getting hit on two fronts each rupee is buying less and less dollars and on top of that what is happening to the oil price the oil price we are just focusing on this part okay for our discussion we are only focusing on this box okay these are all charts these are all charts of the oil price but showing different periods okay i mean the starting period is different for all the charts the ending period is the same okay so now you can see here what is happening in the third chart on the top okay is that in that period what is happening to the oil price is it getting stronger or weaker stronger okay because each barrel of oil requires more and more dollars to buy okay so therefore the oil price is getting stronger so therefore now we are getting hit on two fronts okay so therefore this is what is happening so this is what is meant by now in this case let's think about it so as we we want to discuss the idea of underlying position right how do we understand what is the underlying position and now i'm going to ask you this question of what is india's underlying position in terms of oil okay uh, but before that let's understand this to understand the answer to that question so when oil prices go up it's bad for india and when oil prices fall it's good for india okay this price this part was good for india this price when oil prices were coming up coming down from about over 110 110 dollars came down all the way to about 35 dollars okay this was good for india okay so india is in a situation where and we didn't do anything about it it's just that in our country we don't have oil like saudi arabia and norway and all these kuwait and all these people right it's just bad luck you can think of it as bad luck okay so uh, <clears throat> in this case but india's situation is such that when oil prices go down it is good for us when oil prices go up we are losing we are it is bad for us we can say we are losing money 
and when oil prices are falling we are making money we can say that okay now if i ask you what is india's underlying position with respect to oil because remember position can only be long and short position is either long and short long or either you're long something or you're long, short something okay position is either long or short so we if we ask you the question of india's underlying position in oil is it long or short it's long why okay think of it this way if you go if you go long okay if you go long and then the market declines if you do if you go long let's say you go long crude oil if you go long crude oil and then the market rises after you go long let's say you go long at this point you go long here at 45 dollars at 45 dollars you go long crude oil which means you have done what bought crude oil and sold us dollars this is clear okay after you go long the crude oil price rises so now are you making money or losing money you went long at 45 you bought us you bought crude oil and sold us dollars then after that the crude oil price keeps on rising so at this point when the price goes to 77 are you making money or losing money, losing money. you're making money because now for each let's say even if you bought one dollar of one barrel of crude oil you bought it for 45 dollars and that which you bought for 45 dollars you can now sell for 75 dollars so you're making money okay so now understand the characteristic of a long position what is the characteristic of a long position that if you are long the base asset in any market remember we have understood markets exchanging two assets value to exchange assets two assets a base asset and terms asset okay now what we have seen is that in any market long means purchase of base asset short means sale of base asset and just now you've seen that if you bought if you bought the base asset and after you bought the base asset which is crude oil in this market then the market went up and now you're making money so what is the rule that we can derive from this that if you go long and then the market rises you make money Everyone, I don't think everybody is clear about this. Is this clear so far? That if you go long, you have purchased the base asset and then after you go long, if the market rises, if the market price rises, then you are making money. So the reverse will apply at this stage. If you had sold, if you had sold at, uh, if you had gone long at $100, okay, on the oil price, on this chart, second panel and then the market price dropped to 35 dollars now what is happening are you making money or losing money now you're losing money okay so we can see this rule that is developing that if i go long and then the market drops i lose money if the market rises i make money if the market price rises for a long position so the characteristic of a long position is that when the market price rises it makes money and when the market price drops it loses money is this clear okay now come back to the question of what is india's underlying position okay and because we are talking about position position can only be long or short okay so the position can only be long or short and i'm asking you this question and you know what india's situation is you know what happens to us whether we make money or lose money when prices fall and whether we make money or lose money when prices rise you know all that information right so now if i ask you what is india's underlying position with respect to crude oil in the crude oil market is india long or short some are saying long some are saying short okay let's see both let's test both sides let's test both sides okay so let's assume that india's underlying position in crude oil is remember underlying position is that which you have without really doing anything much just as a result of doing your business going through your uh, going about your business okay so we just we were there as a country we just so happened god didn't give us that much oil okay gave most of it to saudi arabia venezuela and all these countries so this is where we are and that's our, our underlying position has already been determined okay in the case of crude oil so now work back the situation if crude oil you're saying somebody said long india's position is long now what did we do what is the rule that we derived if our position is long in any market when the price rises we should what make money or lose money we should make money so test it for india if when the oil price rises does india make money no it loses money okay and then the other thing about long position is if the price falls you should be losing money so when the price falls in oil does india lose money is making money so long 
cannot be the answer. So then it must be short, short, right? If it's not a boy, then it must be a girl. So if it's that we now test it out for the short side, if India's position in underlying position in crude oil is short, then what should happen when the market rises? We should lose money. Because short position means when you go short and the market rises, you lose money. Is everyone following? Uh, you're getting tired. You're following the logic? Then when the market uh, rise, if you have a short position and the market rises, then you lose money. And you have a short position and the market falls, you make money. So now what is happening in the India's case? Is it matching this? When the market falls, we make money. When the crude oil price falls, we make money. And the crude oil price rises, we make uh, we, we lose money. Is this clear? This much everybody knows. So that means India's underlying position must be short. Are you following the logic? So you don't memorize the stuff, you work it out logically. The only thing you memorize is that, and that also you can work out logically again, that if you have a short position in any market, when the market price rises, you will make money. I'm uh, sorry, when you lose money, and if it falls, you'll make money. If you are long in a market, market price rises, you make money, market price falls, you lose money. Okay, and then you have to have the knowledge of the particular country that is being discussed. Okay, you need to know that India is a net importer of oil. You need to know that Mexico is a net exporter of oil. Okay, so therefore Mexico's underlying position with respect to crude oil will be long. Okay, because India is short. We are so you can reply the same logic, but shorthand you can quickly make. So what is Saudi Arabia's underlying position with long? Okay, so this is the point. So that we were we were discussing risk management and hedge position, but to understand hedge position, you have to understand what is underlying position. Okay, so underlying position is basically this kind of uh, a situation where, without really doing anything actively, okay, you have actually as a result of your normal business operations, you have some exposure to the oil price. You can't help it. You didn't really want to be exposed to the oil price, but you are. So this is what is meant by the underlying position. Okay. So now if you think of hedge position, the hedge position basically has to offset the underlying position. Because think about it, basically what happens is, in this case, if you think about it, now let's think of it uh, from the point of view of an airline. Let's think of it from the point of view of an airline, okay. An airline uh, has to use jet fuel, you know that, okay. Jet fuel is like kerosene, it's a derivative of crude oil, okay. It is it produced by refining crude oil. Okay, so it is the price of jet fuel is very closely related to crude oil prices. Okay, we can show you a chart where you can see how closely they are related. Um, are you guys getting tired? I, I understand that we also have to look at the fatigue factor. We have been discussing for how long now? Uh, we have only 10 minutes left. You need some of that time? So how much time do you need? I, okay, you're giving me 10 minutes, fine. So we will try to at least cover the concept of hedge position so that you will understand one aspect of uh, a corporation. So you guys can uh, manage another 10 minutes. Okay. All right. Good. So here's a chart which is showing you uh, the crude oil and the jet fuel price. Okay. Uh, the relationship between the two, you can see that they're quite closely related. Can you see that? They're quite closely related, but they are not exactly the same. You can see sometimes the, the, the difference is getting very narrow, like here. Here the difference is very narrow, but again uh, somewhere like here the difference is very wide. Okay, so uh, they, they are quite closely related. To understand the, the to to explain this because we have limited time, we are just going to make an assumption that airlines have exposure to the crude oil price. Okay, we are just going to make it to make it simple. But the jet fuel price is very close to the crude oil price. It's a derivative of jet fuel. So crude oil, you make it in the refinery. So jet fuel is actually about it's what you need. It's called ATF, aviation turbine fuel. Okay, so this is what you need to fly an airplane. And jet fuel, as a general fact, all over the world, that uh, jet fuel expense is about 50% of the operating cost of any airline. Okay, 50% of your operating cost is jet fuel expense. Okay, so it's a very big uh, factor in their uh, in their costing and your expenses. So the airlines have a huge exposure to jet fuel prices. Okay, 
So what we want to do is, uh, and in this case now from jet, in the case of we just remove jet fuel and we'll talk about crude oil. We say that they have a huge exposure to crude oil prices, okay. So what is, uh, again let's discuss the underlying position of an airline with respect to crude oil. Use the framework that I just gave you, that if you are, if the, you know what is happening now, if the 50% of your operating expenses is coming from jet fuel, okay, it's crude oil, we're going to just say crude oil. Uh, then if crude oil prices go up, is that good for you or bad for you? Bad for you, it's like you're losing money, okay. It's straight simple maths because your expenses are going up. If, if revenues don't change, your profit is going down, okay, so you're losing money straight out. So if oil prices rise, the airline is losing money. And if oil prices fall, your expenses are going down, so airline is making money. So now answer this question, what is the airline's underlying position with respect to jet fuel or crude oil? Yeah, they're short, their underlying position is short. Clear to everyone now? So this is true for any airline anywhere in the world. Okay, any airline anywhere in the world, you can just say that they are, you can just close your eyes and say that they are, their underlying position is short jet fuel or crude oil. Okay, if you want to use crude oil as a pro proxy for jet fuel. Okay, so now comes the question of hedging. Many airlines, you'll see, they have a very active hedging program. Now, what are they going to do in the case of hedging? What they're going to do is this. They are looking at this, um, they're looking at this crude oil price, okay? They're looking at the crude oil price and they're taking a view on it, okay? Suppose an airline decides that even here at this end, at this point, let's just use this chart, when the price is around $75, okay? If the price keeps on now, there's a lot of talk in the market because of the sanctions on Iran, okay? Other supply disruptions, the oil price might go to $100 a barrel. Okay, there is a discussion in the market. So if the airline feels, let's say take Singapore Airlines, okay, Singapore Airlines, uh, if they feel that the CFO, let's say now the CFO, the CFO of Singapore Airlines feels that the guys, there's a serious risk that oil prices can go to $100, maybe even $110 a barrel, okay. So that's not going to be good for them because their underlying position is short jet fuel. Okay, now what he's going to do, this is where hedging comes in, what he's going to do as a hedge is, he's going to do something he's he's not going to disturb his underlying position okay he can't change his underlying position but what he's going to do is on the side on the side or in parallel to the underlying position he's going to set up some other position which will help to offset his losses okay because if crude oil prices go to 110 dollars a barrel obviously they are going to lose a lot of money in their operations okay but he wants to do something as a hedge so that, at, okay, on the operation side, he will lose money. But on the hedge position, he's going to make money. So that the money he makes on the hedge position will offset the losses on the operating side. Are you following the scheme? Okay, you want to set up some kind of offset. Okay, so this is what hedging is all about. Hedging, you can just remember one word is about offset. Okay, you want to offset what is there in the underlying position. So what you do as a hedge position, what CFO or the CFO of Singapore Airlines will do as a hedge position is he's going to go and buy crude oil futures. Okay, don't worry about what our futures contracts are. But basically he's going to just go into the crude oil market. Like you can see this crude oil market, it's trading here. 68, 66, 63, 66, 66. Okay, this is the price. He's going to go into the crude oil market and he's just going to uh, buy a bunch of crude oil. Okay, let's say we just do a buy. We'll do a market buy. Okay, so this is an example. Let's say I'll do 1000 barrels of crude oil and I'm going to just buy it. Okay, and then it says order executed. So now if you see my position, I do have, uh, okay, actually uh, long, I've got, I already had a, a long barrel, 100 barrels. So you can see here I have long position of 1000. So what this thing is now, what will happen now, this particular transaction I did, this is my hedge transaction, okay? This is my hedge transaction, the CFO of Singapore Airlines. I just went and bought some crude oil because I'm afraid that prices will go from 75 now to about $110 and I'm going to lose a heck of a lot of money in my operations. So I want to do something that will offset that. I need to do something that will make money if oil prices rise. So what do I do? I go into the oil market and I buy a bunch of oil. Okay, that's what I just did. So what will happen now if my view turns out to be correct and the price indeed does rise from 666 to $110, of course I lose more, a lot more money in my operations, okay? My day-to-day -day operations. But on this position I'll make money. 
because I just bought it at 66 something. So what will happen is this will offset whatever money I make over here is going to offset what I lose in my operate, operating business. Okay. So this is the idea behind hedging. So what I've just done is I've hedged a part of my underlying underlying position exposure. Okay. That I have at least set up some kind of a hedge position which will benefit if my underlying position loses money. So it will offset and therefore on a net basis at least I'll be better off. Okay. If you want to go 100% hedged then you will be 100% locked in and you will not lose any more money. Okay. Many airlines is a real business a decision for many many airlines. There is a, there's an airline in, the, in Europe called Ryanair. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's a low cost airline but very successful. Okay. There's an Irish airline. They actually have a sometimes they hedge three to five years ahead for all their operating purchases of jet fuel. They know how much of they are roughly going to buy. They hedge all of that to five years, three years out so that they have certainty. Now they know that my net purchase cost of jet fuel. See what has happened is if let's say the airline was only going to use a thousand barrels of oil. Okay. It was only going to use a thousand barrels of oil just as an example. Now I just bought thousand barrels at 66. What is the price? Um, the price is not given but uh, here I can see it here so yeah I bought it at 66.671 okay so if my operating business also required only a thousand barrels of oil that means what I've done is for all my future oil for my uh, next year's oil purchases which is only thousand barrels I have locked in a price of 66.671 now I will not lose any more money on a net basis because if it goes up from here, the underlying business will lose money, but the hedge position will make money. So on a net basis, I'm okay. I'm balanced. Are you following this logic? So this is basically what hedging is about. And this is what a CFO of a company has to do actively because otherwise you could lose up, lose a lot of money. Okay. Like earlier when this oil price went like this time that you're seeing here, when prices went to here, when prices went to $147 here in 2007, 2000, uh, in 2007 and 8, when it went up like this, many airlines went bankrupt because they just did not expect that kind of uh, price in oil. Okay, and obviously, as oil prices go up, jet fuel prices also go up. Okay, you saw that chart. You can see the same thing here 147 on the crude oil price, and jet fuel prices also go up. Okay because it's a it's derived from crude oil it's like if you have uh, if milk prices go up <coughs> then uh, yogurt prices will also go up okay so this is what hedging is all about this is how you set up and offset and protect your underlying business okay so this is one of the most important roles of the cfo hedging risk management this is what hedging 